and I'm so happy that you're all joining us tonight. We are talking about organic vegetable gardening, and we're designing this program primarily for beginning gardeners or gardeners who are getting back to vegetable gardening, or perhaps you're converting for the first time to organic vegetable gardening. So this is going to be the, basic, the basics of vegetable gardening. As Tula said, I'm a RIN Master Gardener. Master Gardeners in the state of California are a project of the University of California Cooperative Extension. We are here to help home gardeners. And as a resource, we provide a call-in number, a website. We have a, a little newsletter that comes out quarterly for home gardeners. All these are available to you here in Marin County. I have been a master gardener for 14 years, and I've been gardening pretty much my whole life. I started with my grandparents when I was a youngster, so that was a long time ago. But I've been gardening here in the Bay Area for 50 years, and here in, in Marin County, in Southern Marin, for about 20 years. So I really enjoy vegetable gardening. I want to just tell you a little bit about the history of organic gardening. It's been going on for several centuries. It started officially with a man named Albert Howard. He was a British agronomist working in India, and he observed the techniques that were being used there, which meant using basically what was, what was available on the land, in the land, recycling what was, what, what, what was available. Today we think of it as me avoiding any kind of synthesized products, fertilizers, insecticides. Most of those, by the way, come from petroleum products. So we don't use those for either to create fertility, but like fertilizers, nor do we use them to, uh, to make pests for pest control. There is a legal definition, especially if you're a commercial organic gardener. We're not going to really get into that too much, but they must comply with certain standards in order to receive a certification, and they're registered with the state of California. The result of all of, all of this organic gardening is that you have, in, in addition to wonderful tasting fruits and vegetables, you have minimal impact on the environment. You don't have to worry about polluting the land or polluting water. Also, it promotes biodiversity in the garden and sustainability. And because of that, people really are turning to organic vegetable gardening. Now, because you're not able to use the purple stuff or the green stuff or the pink stuff that you sometimes would buy at a garden center, you need to have some way to provide nutrients to your garden. And we're going to talk about, let me just show you our agenda for today. Tula, if you could put that up for us. We're going to have, talk about why it's important to use the, uh, the soil. Then we're going to talk about the plants and the places for doing your gardening, any extra help you might need, and a few other items like how perfect do we really need things. Please feel free to send your questions in. If Tula feels it's appropriate, we'll, she'll interrupt us right away. Otherwise, we may hold it till the end. The program will take about 40 minutes, and there'll be time for questions at the end also. Okay, let's talk about the soil. Remember, the soil is, is the most important place where the plants are going to get their nutrients. Okay, Tula, let's, let's go to the next slide. Probably most of you are familiar with the idea of compost. That is the organic gardener's fertilizer of choice. Compost will improve the structure and the tilth of your soil. And by that I mean your soil will be, instead of being heavy clay, I don't know how most of your backyards are, but where I live, most people have clay. Now I have a friend who lives out in Stinson Beach, and she has mostly sand to deal with. In either case, com compost will act as a way to correct the problems of the soil. If it's very heavy clay that you have, putting compost on will loosen up that soil. If it's sandy, it will provide some structure to the soil and give you some ability for the sand to retain water and nutrients. 
So in addition to improving the structure and the tilt, water retention is also an important part and it will be improved by using compost. compost. It will add some nutrients. It's the main ingredient for organic gardening. Organic gardening, and the reason for that is that it, it feeds the soil, and then the soil will feed your plants. So it's really important to remember. Mulch is another good practice for organic gardeners, and by mulch I mean something that you're going to lay on top of the soil. It could be uh, wood chips. It could be even things like like uh, stones or rocks. But straw is a good mulch. And it, what that does, again, help you keep the, retain the water. It, the mulch eventually will break down, will be composted, and become part of the soil. There are three styles of composting. For those of you who have not had too much experience with it, you could get into active composting. You can either use a bin system or you can use a tumbler system. Passive composting, that would be something like where you build up, dig a pit. And I do this every year when I take my tomatoes out. There's usually a hole where I took the tomato out. I dig it a little bit deeper and I put in there some of my kitchen scraps and then I cover it back up. Usually this is in the fall when I take my, take my tomato plants out. And by the next spring, all of those food scraps have been composted and I now have very rich soil in there instead. Another type of composting is vermiculture where you're using worms to break down the uh, green matter or the brown matter. The green matter would be food scraps, would be your old uh, plant material. Brown matter would be uh, shredded paper, straw, uh, cardboard, anything like that that's mostly carbon materials. Those would be brown. And that both of those, the green matter and the brown matter, it, are important to have good compost. Questions about compost, if you have any of those, let's talk about them as we go along. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk about picking a place where we're going to grow our vegetables. One it's question, really oh, One question for you, Joan, that I think is maybe between these slides. Um, we had a question, is it safe to make a planter box from recycled wood from an old fence that hurt the soil? You know, that's a really good question. Could we, could we just get into the next topic and then that will be part, I'll bring that in part of, of, of what we'll be talking about. Perfect, you know, thank you. Picking a right, a right place, a right place for. Um, most vegetables and fruit need plenty of sun to be, for you to be successful. So it's really important to pick a place where you can have your veg, plant your vegetables or your fruit that gets eight hours of sun. Six hours is an absolute minimum. Eight to 10 in the summer is better. So what you wanna do is find out wherever you're gonna be able to grow this, what direction is south. It's important to know that because you're gonna be orienting all of your plants toward the south. That's where the sun is gonna be, where you're gonna get the most successful sun is toward the south. Another important consideration is pick a place where the water is easily accessible. Your plants are gonna need plenty of water. It, these are not succulents that can get along without much water. Anything that produces fruit or vegetables is going to need some water. So it is best if you've got a hose bib nearby that you could maybe even hook up an irrigation system to that's easier to do than having to haul water in buckets from one place to the next. I'm not saying you can't do it. I do it every year that we have a drought. I much prefer to just haul water myself than I know how much water is going in there. Now let's talk about beds and pots and we'll get into the question the person asked about making a, um, a was it a window box out of, uh, I think it was a window box. Or some the, uh, a planter box out of an old planter box. Okay. I strongly recommend make boxes and pots for growing vegetables. A planter box is, I, and I think it's terrific to recycle materials. As a matter of fact, I have a friend who this week is building a greenhouse and some planter boxes out of old recycled windows that she just had replaced in her house. 
So I'm a great believer in recycling. And generally, you don't have to worry about it, except in the case that there is paint with lead on it. Older, older painted surfaces should probably be tested with lead. And there are at-home lead testing kits that you can get that will tell you whether or not uh, you've got lead in that paint. If there's lead in the paint, let that particular piece of wood go for recycling because it, you don't want lead transmitting through the soil into your pot, into your uh, vegetables. But if it's clean wood or if, it does, if the wood is painted but it doesn't have lead in the paint, feel free to use it. As a matter of fact, I think putting some kind of finish on the, on the, on the wood that you might use to build a planter box will help it last a bit longer. Now let's talk about the, what, what kind of a planter box would be good. First of all, you want one that's going to be at least 12 inches deep. And I say that because that's what you need for the roots to fully develop in most plants. We'll talk about plants and which ones we're going to be recommending, but there are some that don't require quite that much. Tomatoes, yes. Carrots, yes. Beets, yes. Ones that are less than that. So if you only have, let's say, six inches or eight inches, then you want to focus on things like lettuce, spinach, that only really, the root system only really has to be four or five inches deep. So that's, that's why I recommend a 12 inch deep box. Now, as far as the width and the length, the length can be as long as you want it. The width, keep it no wider than that you can reach to, into the middle of the box from both sides. So whatever, hopefully you get access from both sides. Now, if it's a window box, you only make it as far as your arm can reach, no more than about uh, 18 or 20 inches. But if, it's, if you can access it from both sides, then you can make it 36 inches across, 40 inches across, probably pretty easily. If it's a box that you're going to be walking into, in other words, you want to have a planter box that's going to be larger, plan for having some stepping stones that you can access into the middle of the, of the box. Box materials. I've made them out of redwood. I've made them out of um, cement blocks. I've made them out of cedar. Uh, it is worth taking the time and spending the money to have ma using materials that are going to last a while. Because you may find that after three or four years, the box will not, it'll break down and you won't be able to use it again or you'll be doing a lot of repairs. And you're going to spend a little, put, put a little time into building this thing. So make it, make it out of something that's going to last for you. Reinforce the corners, either on the outside using metal L brackets or on the inside by using a wooden post that you can nail the, nail the sideboards to. Another good option are pots. Remember again, we're talking pots that are at least 12 inches deep, and the bigger the plant is gonna be, the bigger the pot you're gonna want the pot to be. So if I'm gonna plant a tomato, I'm gonna to want a pot that's at least 15 inches across, and a minimum of 15 inches deep. So that's a pretty good sized pot for a tomato. Again, with lettuce, arugula, spinach, even some herbs, you can, you can get away with a smaller pot, and I do that all the time. I'm also going to recommend that you think about using a vertical space. I am challenged for the places where I can garden. I have pots here at my home, and I have a plot in a community garden. Here at home, I do everything in pots. I have ornamental pots, but I grow some tomatoes. I grow some herbs and a few other vegetables, and I have a big pot that has a lemon tree in it. Both, of the, both using pots and using beds, think about using the space above the garden. So for example, if you'd like to plant beans, think about growing pole beans. Tomatoes, stake them so that they grow up vertically. All of those make very good uh, ways of using vertical space. And they have some wonderful support systems. They have beautiful, uh, beautiful ones that you can purchase, but again, you can make these yourself. I have a friend who made me two L-shaped uh, L uh, 
trellises that I grow my beans on. One of them right now has uh, sweet peas growing on it. It looks beautiful. And he made them out of metal, uh, a metal grid that is normally called hog wire. Uh, it's four inch square metal grids. And they work just great. And they have lasted already about 10 years. So I can tell you they're, they're very useful every year. Do we have any other questions about where we want to site our, our vegetable garden? Or we have a couple, a couple questions about some of the things you've talked about. Um, Follow-up questions about building the planter box out of recycled materials. Um, what if the fencing wood was pressure washed or pressure treated? And uh, a question about, you were mentioning staining the wood. Um, is the staining safe? Do the chemicals in the stain, you know, you have to worry about them leaching into the soil or should you be using certain kinds of stain? Okay, you need to use food grade stains. When you go to the, to the hardware store, ask for food grade stains or paint, either one, food grade. And that, and that is, make sure you have that. Let me get back to the pressure treated question. Up until about 10 years ago, pressure-treated wood was not appropriate for growing food products, for growing edibles in, because it was, there was arsenic in the uh, treatment process. That is no longer the case as far as I know. So I myself do not tend to want to use pressure-treated because I don't always know exactly when that board was treated. Was it more than eight or 10 years ago or not? But if you want to do it, it is possible. If you get some wood that has just been has been recently treated, so um, they no longer use arsenic, as far as I understand, in the in the treatment process of pressure treated wood. Okay, any other questions about that? Uh, yes. If I build a poly tunnel, can I have less sun? Okay, let's talk about some helpful things that would work other than um, a regular, okay, one of them, it has to do with um, ways that you can, they're, they're called, generally called season extenders. They're a way of protecting your plants or giving them a little extra heat or, or sunlight. And they're very useful. So, um, and also they can, they can protect the plants from other things like insects or other things like that. Um, one of the, one of the things I, that I didn't mention early on is that I'm aiming this garden at Southern Marin gardeners and our climate here has, is, tends to be cool at night, very cool at night. And we have warm, sunny days. We also can have windy afternoons because of that, certain vegetables do better than others. We're very lucky in some ways, but we have challenges with some of our vegetables. And I'm gonna talk about tomatoes at the moment. I think you're gonna have a long program about tomatoes coming up, but they, tomatoes, peppers, and uh, other plants that are in that family need a lot of heat. They do better with a lot of heat. And by that, I mean the heat at night as well as during the day. Our cool nights make it difficult to grow these plants. Now you can select plants and we'll get into that, but another thing you can do is plant them in such a way that sun radiates off of a backdrop. So for example, you could plant a tomato right up next to the house or some other, a wall. And these would be things that would be heated during the day, because remember these are south facing, so we get pick up a lot of heat during the day. And then after the sun goes down at night, that wall will radiate heat back out to the plant and into the soil for a couple of hours. So you're actually going to get the benefit of that in your soil, just as though it was a warmer night for that period of time. Now, eventually it'll cool down and in the morning it'll be cool. But it's a real benefit for heat loving plants like tomatoes. Um, and the same thing, especially when you're starting out your plants, if you've got some sort of a cover over them. And I think that's what this question refers to. Um, all that really does is it doesn't really keep it warmer 
longer. It just keeps a little bit of the warmth in when the sun is shining on it. So you can try it, but I think you're going to find you're still, you might be able to get away with six to seven hours rather than the full eight hours. And I have to tell you, I have a tomato plant that I grow in that gets only three to four hours of sun a day. And because I have, I have spent a lot of time picking the exact right tomato, it does just fine. But that is unusual. Plan for that eight hours of sun. You'll have more success. And that's what I want you to have is a, is a lot of success with growing your vegetables. Any, any other questions, Tula? Uh, yeah, well, one person said that's awesome about the tomatoes and the, the wall radiating heat. Um, additionally, we have another question about the compost um, that you mentioned briefly. Should the compost be mixed into the soil or is placing it onto the top of the garden soil of your garden box okay? You know, one of the things we know now about soil, and gardeners, have, I mean, the farmers are making this change over. Um, we now know that it is not such a good idea to disturb your soil. It is, it is better to just let your soil be as it is. So what that means is anything that you want to be incorporated into the soil, just lay it on top. And I, by that, I mean put a couple of inches of compost on top. Just lay it there. Now, if you do this a month before you plant, by the time you get around to planting, the reason for that is compost is filled with microorganisms. Your soil is filled with microorganisms. And one of the things that they will do is they will pull the nutrients from that compost into the soil. These little critters will actually do that work for you. Now, they're microscopic. You're not going to see this activity going on. But after about a couple of weeks, Everything that was in that compost is now going to be incorporated into your soil, and you don't need, you don't have to do any work, and it's better for the soil to not disturb it. Wonderful. Uh, does that also apply to fertilizer? It also just be left on top. Actually, that is true because what we're thinking of is that our compost is going to do most of the fertilizing. We'll we'll talk a little bit later about some other fertilizers, and then we can get into a little bit more detail about that. Let me make a note of that. And I, I know that Joan is also a compost expert. Um, we have another question. Uh, if you can tell us anything about composting chicken manure from backyard chicken, uh, or if that's a longer topic, we can perhaps send it in the follow-up email. Well, well. I can, uh, what I will tell you is that it, it makes terrific compost. Chicken manure is terrific. I, I do like to see it put, on to, put, put into a, onto the soil a month or so before you do any planting in it, and that, and that allows it to break down properly and be incorporated into the soil. Or if you want to, just put it in a pile off to the side and wait a month or so before you put it on, on the soil itself. Other great, uh, the reason, one of the reasons chickens make such great fertilizer is that they, uh, such great compost is because, the manure is because they tend to eat mostly vegetables. Now they do eat bugs and they do eat worms, but um, they most, animals that that are mostly vegetable eaters and that includes rabbits cows horses that makes the best uh, manure for composting all right avoid we... avoid any any manure from from household pets like dogs and cats <laughs> yeah that doesn't sound great um it looks like we have a lot of questions about composting so i will just say there's a possibility that we might be able to offer a composting specific program in the future um you know, we know that a lot of folks are interested in growing edibles right now, uh, given the recovery garden effort. Uh, so we focused on that, but I'm, I'd be happy to add that to our, our programming agenda. So keep an eye out for that. Um, is there a question? Or a, and pardon, talk, is there a, hmm? I was going to say, should we move on and talk about plant selection? Um, yeah, actually, the next question uh, specifically relates to that. I imagine you'll get to it, but um, one, one participant is curious, what kind of tomato are you having such luck with, with reduced sun time? You said you found a specific type. Uh, okay. That's a good lead in to the kind of tomatoes. Let's, let's talk about the plants and then, and I will talk a little bit specifically about tomatoes and even specifically about my tomatoes. So we want to put the right plant in the right place. And remember, primarily we're looking for sunny spots. I'm going to tell you a couple things that there are ex exceptions to that. In the summer, lettuce goes in the shade, broccoli goes in the shade. If you can wait till the winter, those plants will want to be in the full sun in the wintertime. And that's one of the great things about 
pl about planting vegetables in Southern Marin, you can grow vegetables all year long. I, I pick vegetables 12 months of the year out of my garden. And so some, but let's stick with the summer ones right now. And maybe sometime in the, in the uh, late summer, or early fall, we can come back and do a fall oriented vegetable garden. So again, pick the right plant to put in the right place. We're looking for sunny spots. Let me talk a little bit about the kinds of plants you want to select. I suggest you make a list the, that has two parts. The first part is all the vegetables that you and your family like to eat. That's number one. The second list is the vegetables that, you, that are easy to grow and where you will be successful growing them. And wherever you have, then compare the two, where you have a match between those two, those are the first vegetables for you to plant. Now, what are we planting right now? We are planting all of our summer vegetables, tomatoes, beans, um, cucumbers, um, all kinds of, of um, vegetables that, have, that are leafy greens, the choys, the lettuces, all of those sorts of things. All of those things are available to plant right now. And there are two ways to plant them. You can either plant them from seeds that come in a little seed pack. Can we show the seed pack? Is that available, Tula? I'm sure you've all seen what a seed pack looks like. Um, I can go into detail for you. This one is for a summer squash called Cuba butter. It's a zucchini-like squash, but it's yellow. And it is fatter at one end than the other. This is squash, summer squash. And this plant, this seed pack I've opened up so that you can see both the front and the back of it because there's a lot of important information there. It tells you how many seeds, of course, how much it costs, and it gives you a description and usually a picture. If you like summer squash, which I do, then make sure th that you get some seeds. Now, can you plant this from um, a, a transplanted plant? Yes, you can, but it's just as easy to plant it from a seed. Also on the back of the, of the seed pack, you'll see a lot of information. It'll tell you how deep to plant the seed. A squash seed is about a third of an inch long and a good rule of thumb, plant the seed about three times the depth of the, of the length of the seed. So for this case, you'd want to plant it about an inch in, in a, a half an inch to an inch deep. Also, if you're going to plant three or four or five of them, which means you'll have a lot of squash, then make sure you plant them three or four feet apart because squash plants can get kind of big. And this plant recommends that you plant three together. And then when they come up, pick the one of the three that is strongest and leave that one in and remove the other two. As a matter of fact, I did that with this particular plant and gave them away to other people. They were happy to get them. It also tells you how long it will take for the seed to germinate. And what that means is be, it'll take that long before you start to see a little bit of green poking above the soil. In this case, it says five to 10 days, and that's about how long it took. It was just a little over a week. And then it also gives you information on how long before you will get fruit. In this case, it says 50 days. And what that 50 days means is from when you see the first leaves appearing, actually it's the second set of leaves appearing, to when you egg it, ripe fruit. That, in this case, it says 50 days. Now, I will just tell you here in Southern Marin, Sometimes it takes a little longer. Tula, do we have a question? <coughs> yes, uh, a couple. Well, you're, you're getting compliments about people who enjoy the training very much. Um, if you buy a pack of seeds, how long will those seeds last without being planted <coughs> immediately? The seed pack will tell you right on the seed pack. In this case, it says, packed for 2020. It's right down at the bottom. Sorry. <coughs> no problem. Take, take, take a take second. You've been imparting a lot of information. 
Um, I'll give you the next. It, okay. Uh, the next question, is it too late to plant squash from seeds? You know, it isn't too late. The things you can still plant from seeds would be squash, cucumbers, beans, all kinds of beans. All of those would be very successful from seed, yeah. As well as lettuce, radishes. Um, all of those would be very successful planting. Now, there are many available guides that will tell you when to plant. And I have a couple examples here. You can go online and get them. Almost all of the seed companies will give you information about when to plant seeds, when to plant transplants. And remember, transplants are just seeds that you've planted a few weeks earlier and have now grown into a, plot, a plant in a little pot. And then eventually you're gonna take them out of that little pot and put them in the ground as a small plant. The one that you wanna, some uh, way you wanna make your decision. I always plant from seed if I have the time and if, I, if it does well. I always plant from seed if it's a plant that does not take well to transplanting. For example, cucumbers. Cucumbers, once they, the plant has started, they do not want their roots disturbed. So I always plant cucumbers from seeds. You have to be very careful to do cucumbers from uh, transplants. Does that answer the question about what does well now? I wanted to show you um, one of the things I always do when I plant my garden is I make a, a little chart. I lay that out every year, just on a piece of scrap paper. And I actually keep them for several years in a row because I like to rotate my plants, especially the tomatoes. I don't want to grow the tomatoes in the same place for more than two or three years. So I just draw a little chart as to where I'm going to plant things. Then, once I plant them, I keep a journal and I write down what I've planted. Yesterday, I planted about 20 bean seeds and I wrote it down in my journal. Because it's surprising how after a few weeks, I can't remember how many seeds and when I planted them. And I think that's important to do. I think you'll be rewarded if you do that. You can actually get online aids that will give you suggestions for how to, how to plant a garden, what, how to, uh, what organization to make, and how to replant it in the fall or in the next spring, what to plant and how to rotate the plants around into various spots. Those are all kind of helpful little tip, tips when you're, when you're planting your plants. All right, we've talked about uh, seeds. Other questions? Was there another question, Tula, about what to plant now? Um, we have a question about pests, but I okay. think that would be better suited later on in the... Yeah, we're going to get to that, that, that uh, question about pests, which is very important. Okay, yeah. Um, Otherwise, I think we're good for now. I would like to just point out a few different plants. There are some that are perennials. For example, most herbs are perennials. Not all, but things like um, parsley and um, chives, tarrag I mean, tarragon, oregano. These are plants that will come back for many years in a row. Parsley usually for about, just about two years, then you have to replant. But the others will come back year after year, or they will never go down. Rosemary is one that's with you all year long. Then there are some herbs that, will only, that are only annuals. You have to replant them every year, and you can do it from seeds. Basil is a good example of that. And there are a few others. It will say on your, on your seed pack or look it up online, it will tell you, is it an annual? That means you have to plant it every year. Or is it a perennial? Will it come back every year? Um, some perennial ed edibles are asparagus will come back every year uh, berries if you're going to if you like raspberries or blackberries or blueberries those are, are perennials they'll come back year after year after year but most of most vegetables are annuals and you'll need to plant them 
new from seeds or from transplanted starts every year. And it's a, the, and they will go through their, what that means is annuals means they will go through their whole life cycle from seed through producing fruit to producing a flower, which then makes more seeds in one year. And usually it's in one season. So that probably means in six months, seven months, something like that. So if we plant tomatoes in April or May, they will be finished pretty well by November. Our big tomato month here in the uh, Southern Marin area is September, which also happens to be our warmest month. And it will take that long for most tomatoes to ripen, although you might get a few uh, by the end of July or early August. Would you say that it's too late to plant tomatoes from seed? Yes. At this point? Yes. You need to have your tomatoes in the ground at no later. I have planted them as late as the middle of June, but May is a better month for planting tomatoes. You'll have more success if you get them in the ground from plants. And you need four to six weeks before that for seeds. So it's now a little too late to be planting tomatoes from seeds for us. The but starters, remember it for the starters are the key. And I know that one thing you mentioned to me when we were talking about the timing of this training is that a lot of nurseries in normal years, let alone this year, tend to sell out of the starters on Memorial Day weekend. Everyone's revamping their garden. So. Yes, there's a lot of interest in growing vegetables this year, and I've noticed that the nurseries are a little scarce on plants and seeds both. So I'm hoping you'll have good luck. If you haven't already gotten your seeds and plants, I'm hoping you'll have some luck getting to some, um, some um, nurseries before they sell out. Of course, always it's a good idea. Check with your friends who have vegetable gardens, because sometimes they have extras. Mm, good tip. Okay. Should we, let's, let's oh, go on then. I have one talk. last question. Uh, oh. the, uh, one, one participant says, I've read to use seed potatoes, but I'd like to try planting our old potatoes that have started to grow in the cupboard. Could they do okay, or am I wasting my time if it's not a seed potato? Um, it's a little better to use seed potatoes, but you can certainly try it. I've, uh, it's, it's worked for me. Um, I've, I've done it in the past. Um, if they're already fully sprouted, pretty well sprouted though, those aren't going to work as well. You really need potatoes that are just starting to sprout. You just start to see, and if the sprout comes out of where the eyes are on the potato. So what you want to do is cut them into pieces that have at least one eye, two or three eyes or better, and the pieces should probably be an inch in, inch in, in uh, you know, cut them in like a square or a little um, rectangle that's about an inch in each, on each side. The potato itself is going to, what's left of the potato is going to act as the main nutrient source to get those, uh, to get that uh, plant started. And so you, you need a potato that's still pretty fresh, not one that's all, really, all dried out. All right, so young, not blind potatoes. Uh, are you ready for the next slide? Yes, we are. So let's talk about, oh, okay, let's, I wanted, here's another couple examples. I like to plant some ornamental plants, in this case a pink geranium, along with uh, edibles. In this case, I've got rosemary planted. This is right outside my front door, right next to the tomato that grows out there. Okay, next slide. Oh, there's the tomato. Um, you can see that that is a big pot. And, and tomatoes come in two styles. One are called determinate and one indeterminate. Determinate tomatoes grow to a certain length. Tomatoes are actually a vine. They grow to a certain length. They start developing their flowers and setting the fruit out of the flowers all at pretty much the same time. And as a result, they, they're a little bit more manageable. Indeterminate tomatoes continue to grow and grow and grow, and they would continue to grow for a year or two if you let them, until, they, until frost killed them probably. And they can become very large. And they will set their fruit at different times. And you will continue to get fruit over a longer period of time. If you want to use your tomatoes for canning, and you want all your tomatoes to come pretty close together, grow determinate tomatoes. 
If you want it from, for salads and sandwiches and you, you want them over a longer season, grow indeterminate ones. But if you grow indeterminate ones, they need support, especially if you're going to grow things vertically. And here's a tomato cage with three or four stakes in it to support the tomato cage because this tomato is going to get big, I hope. Next, next slide. Let's see what we have coming next. All right. Let's talk about some extra things. And this is where we, I want to talk a little bit about fertilizers, too, when we get down to talking about pollen. All plants that, set, that have fruit need to be pollinated. And what that means is that you need the male and the female pollen to come together. Remember, what fruit is being produced is because of a reproductive process that the plants are going through. And so we need to get the male and female parts together. And most plants, you need two different plants to do that. And you need something to carry the male for, and over to the female and fertilize it. Bees are a very good way of doing that. There are other living things that do it. We have a lot of kinds of bees. Butterflies do it. Birds do it. Bats do it. There are hummingbirds do it. So there are a lot of different ways, but the most common around here are bees. European honeybees, we have a lot of local native bees that do it. For example, tomatoes are pollinated by, bum by bumblebees. Uh, European honeybees pollinate squash, beans. Many, many plants are pollinated by European honeybees. So the best, what you want to do is make your garden as attractive to these pollinators as possible. Now, under normal circumstances, they'll eventually find your plants because they're around, but it's awfully nice to give them a little incentive. And one of the ways you can do that is by, grow, is by planting some attractive plants next to your, next to your, uh, your vegetables. Sunflowers are wonderful. European, all bees love sunflowers. So if you plant a few sunflowers, the peas will, bees will come for that and they'll find your squash or they'll find your tomatoes or they'll find your beans. You need those pollinators to do that work for you. I have known of people who try to hand pollinate squash. I've even tried it once or twice. It's a labor, I have to tell you. It's a lot of work. Be thankful for the pollinators and do what you can do to support them. Native plants are the best thing to do to support pollinators, native pollinators. So the kinds of plants I'm talking about are, are as I mentioned, sunflowers, um, there are zinnias I usually plant, marigolds, um, many, many plants, something that is attractive to them, even dahlias that I grow in my, in my uh, garden. Native plants and other plants that are brightly colored to attract pollinators. Very important. Okay, what about pests? Snails are probably one of the biggest problems that we have for our pests, but we have a few others too. But before I talk about, uh, so we've talked about pollinators as being the beneficial part of the insect world, but then we have the pest part. Aphids, snails, these are things that are real problems for gardeners. But I'm going to encourage you to be as conscious as you can about the environment when you're dealing with pests. So for example, I would suggest with aphids, they are very, it's very easy to get rid of them if you just use a strong spray of water on them. Aphids hold on with two little mouth parts and once those are broken and they're knocked off the plant, they're done. They can't do any more damage to you. Snails. Hand pick the snails, go out early in the morning. Another good solution, take a rolled up newspaper, put it on the soil, they'll crawl inside and you can just dispose of it in your compost bin. That's a great addition to the compost bin. Um, there are many other pests that, that you can deal with, but if you can use some sort of barrier, of a mechanical barrier, for example, deer and raccoons, Put up some sort of fencing. A good six-foot fence will keep out most deer. Now, they will grow over it, go over it if they really want to, in which case you may have to go to an eight-foot fence. But it's the most, in most gardens, a six-foot fence will keep deer out. Same thing with raccoons. Just make sure that it doesn't have big holes in it anywhere or that they could get under it. Rabbits are another problem. 
Same thing. Fencing is the best way to deal with them. Chicken wire underneath your soil, two levels of chicken wire, are the best way to keep out moles, gophers, and voles. Moles and, and gophers, because they burrow underneath your garden. They are not really there to eat your plants. They're there to... To um, they're there to eat the grubs or the worms in the soil. The, that's what the that's what the moles want. Gophers want to will eat your plants. They'll disturb your plants, and so you really don't want that to have, to be there either. So some kind of underlayment, as I said, chicken wire. You can even use landscape cloth at the bottom so that so that you they can't burrow in underneath. Hand picking snails. Someone asked earlier, I think, about row covers or uh, strips or some, things like that. Great way to keep birds off of your young plants. When your plants first emerge from the soil, especially things like beans, peas, the birds will come and want to eat them. There have been years when I've had to replant my beans three times because the birds were so hungry. Eventually, they got tired and they'd had enough. But if you can use some sort of a row cover, or a just a little um, a strawberry basket turned upside down, anything like that until the plants get large enough so that the birds will not bother them. Okay, that covers a lot of types of moles, of uh, pests. By the way, a strong, healthy plant is the best defense you have against destructive bugs, especially. Most plants have, will be able to protect them their, itself if they are strong enough. So get your plants to be strong, good compost on your soil, and, and then you won't have so many problems to deal with. I do think we want to talk a little bit about some cultural controls. I strongly suggest you avoid overhead watering of your, most of your vegetable plants, particularly tomatoes. Make sure that you water from underneath the plant. That will avoid things like uh, rust, viruses, blights. Tomatoes are very disease um, prone. First of all, start by picking a tomato that's more disease resistant. Because our climate is a challenge, it's better, it's better to find a tomato that will do well for you. And the same thing goes for, for cucumbers and for squash that are very susceptible, for example, to powdery mildew. Find a variety that you like that is resistant to powdery mildew or other diseases that you might have in your, in your um, garden. And then avoid watering the leaves of the plant, especially later in the day. Do most of your watering early in the day, and that gives the sun and the wind time to dry off the leaves so you don't have water sitting on them. I do a lot of pruning of my plants for tomatoes, for example. Any plant that has touched the ground, the lower leaves, I remove from the plant. I also remove some in, in the middle so that it, more air circulation takes place. If you do have any leaves on the ground, make sure you clean them up. Every time I go to the garden, I leave some time to clear the soil of any leaves that have come off the plant or are touching the soil. Stay on top of weeds. Weeds are a part of life. They're part of the garden. Gar gardeners hate them, but they're there. Just stay on top of them because they will compete with the plants that you care about for nutrients and for water. And you don't want, you want that, new, that water and those nutrients to go to your vegetable plants. So don't let the weeds rob your vegetables of, those, of the water and nutrients. And finally, I'd like to give you a tip. It is really important that you look at your plants, every single plant. Turn over the leaves because that's where bugs will try to hide. And if you see aphids or if you see some kind of little worm thing, get it off as soon as you see it. I just squish them with my fingers. Doesn't bother me at all. Make sure you spend time looking at your plants. Examine them. All, all over the plant. 
All right, now we were going to talk a little bit about products and what somebody asked about fertilizer. And I forgot now exactly what the question was. Do you remember, Tula? Yes, well, they were primarily asking about whether it should be mixed into the soil or, or just oh, yes. on top. Right. Um, most fertilizers, you want to just scratch them under the soil a little bit because they will lose some of their potency as the sun beats on them, that sort of thing. Um, try again. Organic, this is organic gardening. You want products that are organic products. And those are things like um, fish-based products, seaweed products. Um, you can, and, and some nurseries will specialize in that. There are some nurseries that only carry organic products. All nurseries now will have products labeled, whether or not they are, they are organic or not. So synthetic, we want to put that aside. The petroleum-based synthetic products, in other words, they take the petroleum, they synthesize it, they break it down and rebuild it into various, its various components, and that's how they make a synthetic product. We want to put those away. Get rid of those. Focus on the products that are going to stay whole. In other words, they have nutrients in them, but they are not synthesized. And as I said, you will find those at your garden center if you feel you need them. Now, honestly, I don't very often have to add those kind of products because my soil is pretty enriched already. I feed those microbial uh, critters that are in the soil, and they do the work for me of, of feeding my, my plants. So does that answer that question? I think so. Um, okay. Is it, is it okay if that, that fertilizer just gets uh, laid on top? So the fertilizer, I think it's best to scratch it in a little bit into okay. the soil. Right, but not, not the full mixing you think of when you think of thinly. Oh, no. You don't, no, you don't have to dig it in. Just scratch it a little bit in so, that it's, so it's covered up a little bit by the dirt. Okay. All right. Um, we Remember, we're trying to make this gardening easy for us. True. We have a couple other questions, but I will save those for the end since we're almost there anyways. Okay. Just a couple other things that I want to mention about some various other controls. Um, neem oil is a uh, organic product that comes from the neem tree, which is primarily grown in India. And you can make it into a spray for, for a test called a thrip or a leaf roller. Uh, there are, there's a product, of organic product for snails and slugs that's, um, that you can get at almost every nursery now. Just make sure you follow the directions. People tend to overuse this product, and birds eat it, and that kills the birds. There are dormant sprays. In other words, you spray when the plant is dormant. This is primarily used for, for fruit trees, apples, peaches, plums, that sort of thing. And those are horticultural oils. You spray them when the plant is dormant, which for us means in the winter months. And you usually have a series of, of times to spray. So you might do one in January, one in February, one in March. Uh, you'll follow the directions on the, on the package. That's really critical for every product you buy is that you read the directions and follow it. I like to use sticky traps for thrips. In other words, this is a mechanical control. I just hang up one or two sticky traps and the thrips go there rather than on my plants. Someone told me the other day about if you have voles, which are a little mouse-like critter, that'll come in and they love to eat plants. Um, and they look like about a two-inch mouse. Some people call them field mice. Somebody told me the other day that castor oil works for them, works on that. Um, okay, I think that about covers the various uh, non-toxic types, types, types of, of controls and products. Can you um, use that, uh, the dormant sprays on lemon trees as well? You know, usually lemon trees do not need to be sprayed. And uh, unlike apples, lemon trees have produced primarily in the winter months. Start growing usually for us, usually in November, and it'll be ripe by mid to late December. And then you'll get another crop often in May, and it'll be, it'll be ripe by the middle of June. Um, and usually lemons are pretty disease free. There are a few diseases. If you get into that, you want to spend some time studying about citrus fruit, growing citrus fruit. 
Meyer lemons are about the best lemon to grow for us in our climate. We're kind of right on the edge of citrus products. There are only a few that do well here. Um, so you'll want to study which ones work the best for us. Remember, right plant in the right place, right climate. One, one little plug there. Uh, actually, our next Master Gardener program is a week from tomorrow at 7 p.m. It is specifically on citrus tree gardening. It's called there you go. Citrus Tree Gardening. So there you more go. details to come. Uh, next slide. Yeah. All right, let's, let's talk about a few things. With organic garden, remember that some of your garden is going to go to critters. You're not going to be able to protect all of your plants from everything. One of the things, I, le I learned this quite a while ago, so what I do is I plant extra. So if the, if, the, if the birds get a few of my bean seeds, that's not too bad. I've planted enough. If, if a vole gets in and eats some of my carrots or eats, eats some of my squash, I've planted two squash plants, so I always have enough of it. They, they are living creatures. They have to eat. They're not there to be, as a, don't take it personally, they're not there to, to do you any damage. But they will, when they're full, they're done. They won't keep eating past what they need. And it, during the summer, there's so much for them to eat that after you get things started, it shouldn't be a problem. Just don't, don't let it get you too much. Also, I'd like us to think about how perfect does our food have to be? I am willing to eat an apple that's got a little bit of damage to it, which I can always cut out. I, I, today I ate a strawberry that some critter had eaten a little bit off of. I just cut that piece off that I got out of my garden. I'm starting to get strawberries in my garden now. Um, I just am willing to put up with a little bit of less than perfect fruit in, or, or vegetables in order to, to have good quality that I don't have to worry about me or my family or friends eating it. And I've just developed that over, over the years. So I would just suggest, think about how important is it that things be visually perfect for you rather than perfect for you nutritionally and for the planet. I just want to tell you that there are many resources out there. Use Google or wherever, whatever uh, other source you have to go online and get all the materials you want. The library has some wonderful books. Tula can tell you what they have available at the library. And the Master Gardener office. You can give us a call. Usually we're open and you can come in. But even if you, it, right now, all you can do is give us a call or use our website or use our um, email address. And that'll be available to you at the end. Right, Tula? You'll have that? And um, so use all your resources to help you with, along with this project. I just want to say good luck to you. I think you will really enjoy it. I love gardening, and in this day and age, it's one of the, it, it, has, it has got me through the last couple of months, believe me. Thank you very much for coming. Tula, do we have any last questions? Yes, uh, I believe there are some people asking about that specific tomato variety you like. Oh, yes. <laughs> you're willing to name it. The, I, oh yes, I am absolutely. It's it's a uh, it's a Hungarian. I think it comes from Hungary or Czechoslovakia. It's spelled S T U P I C E, Stupici. S T U P I C E. But believe me, there are many of them. There are many of them that do well in our climate. Uh, they've done a lot of hybridizing of tomatoes, and don't be afraid of hybridized tomatoes. They're they're fine. Think about. Um, Many of, think about the small cherry tomatoes or uh, grape tomatoes for, for us that in our climate, they do very well and really tasty. I agree. Uh, Thank so you at, very much. At the bottom of this slide, uh, we've got the Marine Master Gardener website that'll also be included in the follow-up, uh, but I'll give you a little bit to copy it down if you'd like. Um, a couple other questions. Is it too late to plant sunflowers from seeds? No, not at all. All Sunflowers right. are fine. Uh, May is a great month for planting. What do you do for powdery mildew? So I have developed um, a, I use um, boric acid, boric, uh, borax is, is a product that you can use. And you, um, you just, it's about a, a, 
ratio of about a tablespoon to a gallon of water and spray it on the leaves. And it takes care of it, it's terrific. And add, add a drop or two of dishwashing, like Dawn or one of those kind of dishwashing. It helps it stick to the leaves a little bit longer. It does a great job. Get on that powdery mildew early, though. Don't let it take over your whole plant. And if, right. if there's some leaves that are too far gone, just pull them off. Wonderful. Uh, another question. Um, one, one participant says, I've been growing fennel and artichokes for a few months. They were starters, and we began in late February. When can oh. you determine when to pull fennel? The artichokes almost look ready, but not sure. Well, great luck, great on your on your artichokes. Um, art, May is usually the month when you when you will harvest artichokes in California, and they do very well here. The plants are a little large for m many small gardens, but they're you know they're a California plant, so they're great. Um, fennel. So when do you know it's ready? So what you're going to be eating from fennel is the is the underground bulb that it grows from. And you wanna let that get as big as you can. And then you get this top that's kind of fronds and you know, it's a, it's a beautiful top. And the whole plant has that lovely smell of anise. That, um, I just love that. I love that plant, I really do. Um, I will tell you that fennel itself, the best time to plant it is in July and you will typically be harvesting it in the, in the winter months. So from November to March or April, like that. Um, so you, you've probably got another four months or so before you're going to be able to harvest your fennel. I mean, to get a good size bulb. But you can plant it as late as, as July. Uh, all right, we've got, uh, do, you, do you have any particular recommendations for either squirrels who dig up every uh, freshly uh, sprouted plant or uh, uh, mealybugs? Okay, mealybugs. Um, I like to use, I just dip a Q-tip, um, you know, the little cotton at the end of the, of the uh, stick in alcohol and then just dab it where the mealybugs are. Now again, don't try not to let this infestation get out of control because it's, this is a, a really laborious if you have to do this on every single joint because the mealybugs like to live in the joints between the leaf and the stem. But if you only have a, little, a few of them, try that technique. It has worked for, worked for me many times. And, and what was the first part? Uh, squirrels. Oh, squirrels. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have any good answers for squirrels. Um, Except, as I said, if, if you have a cat, they're, they're very helpful, very helpful with, with squirrels. And cats, and cats and terriers, I find, are very helpful with squirrels. A little bit of little old ladies follow the fly going on there. <laughs> uh, so uh, how often should we prune our plants? Okay, if you're talk let's say we're talking about a perennial. That means a plant that's going to come back year after year. Um, some plants will go down to their roots and, and re-sprout from their roots. And so you don't have to worry about pruning on those at all. But if what you want to do is, let's say you have a fruit tree or something like that, you, most plants want to be pruned when they're dormant, when they're not growing. That's the best time to prune most plants, most perennials. Again, there are a few exceptions. And so you can go online and check a particular plant and it, it, it will likely tell you. If you're going to do some pruning, for example, on an annual, like a tomato plant, any time at all is fine. I like to prune my tomato plants so that I get large, fewer fruit, but larger fruit. And then I also like to make sure that there is some air circulation inside of the plant. That way there's, it's less likely to, get, to have viruses and blights growing on the plant itself. And you can, you can do your pruning anytime it suits you at all on, on, on annuals. All right. Uh, okay, I think our time is probably about up. Yeah, everything else I'm seeing is just a whole lot of thank you. So thank you so much, Joan, from all the thank you all and me. Um, and, and thank you to the Marin Master Gardener Program and Julie Witts for helping us manage all of this. Um,
if you are interested in our future programs, I did drop a link to the citrus tree registration in the Zoom chat. Uh, but I'll also be including that in the follow-up email along with the link to where we'll be posting this video on YouTube so you can go back and, and check, your, uh, check your notes. And uh, we'll include the link to the Marine Master Gardeners website and also their help desk email. Usually they have a phone hotline. Right now no one's in the office. Um, but if you have any specific questions about particular plants, please feel free to uh, send them an email. And if you have particular questions for Joan, you're welcome to send them my way and I will pass them on to her. Bye. So uh, thank you all so much.